Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another great, super cool radio interview. I'm your host, as always, Matthew Thomas. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have an awesome guest joining me at this time. This year, Blacklist Union released two killer singles entitled The Queen of Everything and Letters from the Psych Ward. Please welcome from Blacklist Union, Tony West. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very nice to have you on the show. Very nice to be chatting with you. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, glad to be here. Now, focusing on uh, Blacklist Union, um, how was the name created? I'm very curious. Uh, well, I mean, you know, um, my goal was to put together a band of the best musicians uh, with the worst reputations. So, hence Blacklist Union. Right on, right on. I could definitely, I could definitely dig that. All right, so now, obviously, as I said, uh, Blacklist Union's been very active this year. Um, I know the previous album's been a few years already. Uh, so for this year, um, it, you've released two singles, as I said. Uh, it feels like it's got a little bit of a different um, kind of feel and um, vibe to them. Has it been a different experience with this new batch of music compared to previous releases? I mean, you know, every, every record... Uh you know, hopefully as an artist evolves, um, you know, but we do still have the same quintessential, you know, Blacklist Union sound. It's like, you know, kick ass, rock and roll, um, high energy. I'm very influenced by punk rock. Um, but, you know, there's a couple songs on there too. You know, I'm, I'm very influenced by who I just mentioned, Mother Love Bone, who is an amazing Seattle band. Um, so there's, there's some of that in there as well, the kind of slow groove, but there's the high energy rock stuff. And then um, the last record, Back to Momo, you know, I, I wrote with Todd Youth, who passed away in 2018. And, you know, Todd was in, a, a, he's a legendary punk rock, kind of rock and roll icon. And he was in D-Generation, which was a New York City band in the 90s. Um, he played with Ace Freely, he played with Danzig, he played with Glenn Campbell, like he's, he did all kinds of shit. Um, so it was a little difficult after Todd died. He was my writing partner. You know, he wasn't in the band, although he did gigs with us. Um, you know, he was my writing partner and we had a special chemistry. And after he died, it took me a while to find somebody I can write with. How was that process of finding somebody, um, somebody else to, to write these songs with? I mean, it was very difficult, actually. And um, I ended up writing it with the guy who produced all the Blacklist Union records, Chris Johnson who knows my voice, he knows, I mean, he helped me create our sound. So, and plus he is a songwriting machine. And, you know, like Todd, you know, when it, songwriting is, is basically, man, you know, like composition, like English composition, you know what I mean? And um, I used to get begged by my English teacher in high school to come to class because I would do all the assignments, but I wouldn't come to class because I'd tell him I had better shit to do, although I found out later that was bullshit. But I always liked writing, you know, so with writing songs, it's really no different than writing a story, even musically, because, you know, <clears throat> you want to have an intro to an outro. And, you know, believe it or not, a lot of people don't understand that concept. And, you know, it was kind of hard to find someone that did. And, <clears throat> but really, it wasn't because the guy was in my, you know, peripheral the whole time, you know, so. No, I got you. For, for sure, you know, it is very hard. I know, you know, you've, you've definitely talked about in other interviews and I've said in other interviews as well. It's very hard to find a, you know, songwriting partner that, like, understands you and also, like, uh, kind of fits what you're going for. Yeah, and with Todd, like, I didn't have to explain to Todd, like, check out Turbo Negro, you know, check out GBH, check out this ACDC record. Like, Todd already had all that shit in his DNA. Like, he schooled me, man, you know what I mean, which was great, you know. And um, and that's, that's hard to find. I always say, like, um, you know, finding a songwriting partner is like trying to find a wife. Like, it's not very easy, you know, so... Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And I did want to talk about. So as I as I said in the intro, um, you have the the new album said to be released in September. Uh, what can people like expect, like musically and lyrically, from this new album? I mean, you can expect kick ass rock and roll that'll make you wanna fuck and fight and drive fast and like you know, shit like that. But um, lyrically, you know, after Todd died, I went to 
the Amazon jungle in Peru with the Shipibo Indians, and I did ayahuasca five times. So I don't know if you're hip to what that is or anything. I don't know. So it's a heavy indigenous medicine that is ancient and um, takes you on a fucking trip to the other side, and um, and it lasts hours, like 10, 12 hours. It's very heavy, and you know when when Todd passed away. I was like, man, I can't let his death destroy me because, you know, I've let people's deaths destroy me, man. And I needed tangible proof that there was something beyond this realm, which it, it sounds ridiculous to me now because I, I know that's so the case now. Uh, but before I started doing plant medicine, specifically ayahuasca and then Ibogaine and DMT, um, you know, I questioned that. Um, so lyrically, all of those, all of these songs are about pretty much that healing process and journey. So that that's very, very interesting. I, um, you know, not, not very familiar with it, but, um, but to have those kind of experiences then to, you know, obviously based some of the songs on that, I think is, is, is very cool. And also, so like when you said you were in the jungle, was that something you just kind of spur of the moment went to, or is that like um, something you kind of planned out? Like how did you, you know, determine you were going there? Um, so I, ayahuasca was on my radar and I, and I, and I had done it once before in this LA church thing, which is like, I hate to say pose poser, but it was trendy ish. You know what I mean? And I'm not down with the trends like i'm kind of like consider myself a trailblazer like i've always done my own thing so i knew that ayahuasca where it came from was the amazon jungle in peru so i did research and found a tribe that I, me and my girl could go to and do it you know so. but that's very interesting very um very cool and very um, unexpected, you know, uh, just to, to hear about that. But I think that was, it sounds really awesome. How was, like, how was overall, how was that experience? I mean, it was life-changing, you know. Um, there's really, uh, there's no words, man. Um, you know, uh, it, it took me to places that, you know, you you know these places, but but we don't fucking know that we know these places. You know, it's really heavy. Like, I mean, dude, there's definitely like I, you know, my girlfriend Bianca, she was a singer for Betty Blowtorch. She died. I remember one time when we were dating, she said to me, "Do you think we'll be okay when we die?" And I was like, "Well, we're okay right now, which means we probably were okay. You know, which means we were okay before we got here. So chances are we'll be okay after." And like, you know, I had these things instinctively in me, but still as a human, you have doubts, you have loss, you have pain. There's fucked up shit that happens on the planet to children or elderly people. So, you, you know, you question that shit. You know, I remember one night, um, they're like, okay, Tony, for dinner tonight, uh, you have a choice. Um, you can have chicken, jungle rat, or monkey. I was like, uh, yeah, I'll have the chicken. <laughs> yeah. But it was beautiful and a heavy experience that um, was so beautiful, man. It really was. All right, and that's really awesome to hear. I'm glad it was um, you know, a really great experience and really eye-opening for you as well. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, uh, you have been working on and creating some new music based on some of your experiences there as well. So I, and I did want to talk about um the some of the new singles obviously as i said i really enjoyed letters from the psych ward i really enjoyed the music video for it and i'm so i'm curious for you how is uh how is it filming the music video for letters for the psych ward man you know so we ha uh, we have a new manager paul crosby who is the, he was the drummer in saliva for years and those guys have been friends of mine for years fucking couple couple decades uh, but, um, you know, Paul started managing us and then he connected us with this video guy named Thomas Crane, who's done all kinds of shit, uh, Queensryche and all kinds of bands. Um, I love working with Thomas. He's a great guy. And so creative. And, you know, he's the guy that like you see his wheels turning while he's filming. Like 
he's a visionary, you know, and I gave him full reign. Like, I mean, I had a couple of ideas, like, you know, the straight jacket was my idea and, you know, performance video and, and so forth. But he does all the editing, the filming, like, it was so great working with him. And he did the letters from the psych ward video. And then he also did the queen of everything video. And then our third, um, single which is coming out uh this month or the, the first week of august called dirty halo he also did that video and um uh, dirty halo is a, probably one that's closest to my heart uh, you know we covered mia which is an aerosmith song off um night in the ruts which my daughter was named after that my daughter is 11 and i'm gigantic pain in my ass right now but i love her and so I hold that song closest to my heart, but Dirty Halo is the next one in line because, um, you know, we filmed the video right after Wayne Sweeney died from Celia, and he was my friend, man. I loved him. He was such a beautiful guy. Like, I loved him, man. He was a rock and roll soldier. And, you know, so in Dirty Halo video, I'm wearing a shirt that's a picture of Wayne on it. And then um, the last shot is a saliva shirt with on the back it says sweeney 96 that was his last t-shirts they were printing out and uh but also you know bef before wayne died this of course the song was written dirty halo and you know it's about todd youth it's about all kinds of friends that i've lost along the way along the way dh Peligro, who is my good friend from the dead kennedys who just died where where you know we're all a little tainted. We're all a little fucked up. Like you gotta be a little crazy to even make it in this fucking world, you know? And, you know, but fundamentally most people, not all are good people. You know what I mean? So with dirty halo, it's like, I don't mind your dirty halo. You know, it's kind of about acceptance, man. You know? So I look forward to dropping that video too and single. It's going to be a good one. I definitely look forward to checking out. I really like the the meaning and the messages behind uh, behind the song as well, and especially in the music video as well. I definitely look forward to checking it out. Yeah, thank you. So I'm curious for you. So what have been, like, obviously there's been some music videos, obviously for the new batch of songs, plus previous releases as well. Do you have a favorite music video so far that you've filmed? You know, I, I mean, the new shit, you know, is really really great I, and the dirty halo video man you know i saw it and i was wowed and i'm hard to wow you know and and like that's my goal with blacklist unions music and live performances like my fucking goal is to make sure people are wowed because how often does that happen not very often you know so yeah, for sure. No, it, it is very hard nowadays to actually like either surprise people or like impress people or wow people, as you said. It's kind of hard nowadays to actually to capture that and to wow yourself in the process is yeah. really cool. And it's it's not as easy, uh, you know, done than, you know, what people might think. No, not at all. And, you know, uh, I, remember, I don't know if you're familiar with a band called Turbo Negro. I am, yes. Uh, one of my favorite bands, one of my biggest influences. And, you know, with their live show, I used to walk away saying, wow, you know, and like, that's what I'm going for. So. No, right on. And, uh, before you know, I got some, a few closing questions before we get to that though. Uh, so for you, like, obviously this is, uh, you know, the new release for the blacklist reunion this year. So I'm curious for you, like when you release music, I know when like I release like interviews and videos and stuff, there's always part of me that thinks like, Oh, are people going to like this? Are people going to care. Do you ever get those like similar feelings when you release new music? I mean, you know, my friend told me once, you know, if you don't have haters, you're a nobody, you know? So, and then even with Paul Stanley, like Kiss, I'm really not a fan of Kiss, but guess what? Millions of other motherfuckers are. Like, it doesn't matter what the fuck I think. Like, I like a few of their songs and I totally respect them and I love their merch and shit. But I remember like with Ace, I, there was an interview once and, and they asked Ace the question and Ace was like, yeah, well, you either love us or hate us. And, and Paul stopped them right there and goes, and for those who love us, blah, 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 blah. So the haters don't even fucking matter. 
haters are part of the equation, really, because I don't know if you saw the Elvis movie, but um, how his manager was like, he bought I hate Elvis buttons. And they were like, why did you get that? And he's like, well, we have I love Elvis buttons, so why don't we sell them to the people that hate us, too, you know? I was like, that's genius, <laughs> you know? So haters are just part of it, man. Like, don't get discouraged by that shit. You know, and people, especially nowadays with online and everybody's a fucking critic. And then um, you also have the people that are in a mood like that just will fire off some shit because they're angry about whatever or, you know, man. So it's all part of the process, really. I Trust me, dude. I have plenty of haters. But I, I don't fucking pay attention to that. I got to go where the love is. That's where, you know, one of the plant, the plant medicine stuff taught me. Go where the love is. Because I had a gnarly fucking childhood, like, you know, with a gnarly family that was toxic and all. So I had a lot of pain behind that shit. And, and you know, I got to let go of that and, and go where the love is. Like, my children love me. You know, my girl loves me. Like, people love me. So I got I to gotta concentrate on that. That was really good. I, I really like that. Uh, you know, going where the love is. That's um, very, very well said and uh, very true. Especially in this life, there's there's so much negativity and toxicity in the world that yeah. you have to find those pockets of love. You know, throughout throughout your life. Right. Really awesome. Really awesome. All right. Uh, just a few more things. We're wrapping this up. So this is probably the most challenging question I will ask you as I'm closing out this interview. But what have been some of your favorite moments from your musical career so far? I mean, you know, um, I mean, recording wise, like I remember our first record, I, I did um, a song for Bianca, who I mentioned from Betty Blowtorch, who was my girlfriend. And um, it was on the five year anniversary of her death. So this was, a, oh no, it was four year anniversary. So this was in 2005 when we were doing our first record. And um, I had it set up where I was going to go to her grave and then beeline to the studio and record this song called dying to live which i wrote for her and um so that's what i did and i remember i did one pass and i look over at the producer and our bass player and their jaws were hanging open and i was like what did that just suck and they're like no dude you just nailed it all the way through like and it was the first time i ever nailed a song all the way through and as a singer man that's kind of a big deal because it doesn't happen often it's happened maybe twice since. Um, so that's a special moment. Another special moment is on this new record um, when I was recording Mia, which is an Aerosmith song, and fucking Steven Tyler is like the best, you know? Like there's nobody better and, you know, um, and I remember I was texting Josie, the original singer for Saliva, and I'm like, I'm scared, dude. And he's like, dude, you're gonna kick ass, you know? So I, I sang the song and I remember before I, I sang it, uh, the producer and the engineer were both like, you know, this is kind of a hard song. And I'm like, ah, no, nah, I'll be fine. So I sing it, dude. And I remember every time I hear this song now, I'm going to think of this, but the, the producer and the um, engineer were, were standing up in the control room with their arms in the air cheering because I was nailing this shit. Like I have goosebumps talking about that. But those are special moments recording. And then, you know, live, um, you know, I mentioned Mother Love Bone. Uh, Andrew Wood was my biggest influence as a kid. Like, so for those that don't know Mother Love Bone, um, Andy died and then they got Eddie Vedder and became Pearl Jam. So I'm really not a fan of Pearl Jam. They've sold more records than me, but that whole droney um, vocal, it's just not my deal. But Mother Love Bone was magical, like Zeppelin. And um, so Andy had a band before Mother Love Bone called Malfunction, which a lot of people don't know about because Mother Love Bone was only in existence for the last two or three years of Andy's life. Before that, there was Malfunction that played with Soundgarden, that played with Nirvana, that played with Alice in Chains, you know, Mud Honey, Screaming Trees, all those bands. And... Um, Mike Starr was a friend of mine from Alice in Chains. He was my roommate. So when he died, um, I did a gig for Mike, a memorial gig, where I sang a set of Alice in Chains songs and I sang a set of Mother Love Bone songs. So that tape got to Kevin Wood, who is Andy's brother, 
and the guitar player for Malfunction. They asked me to fucking join the band, dude. My hero's band, Malfunction. So we did a bunch of gigs, and um, man, I would sing. And these are songs I learned how to sing to these songs. Um, I knew them inside out, every nuance. I still do. I practice them all the time. But all of a sudden, I'm singing in my hero's band, dude. You know, playing in Hollywood and playing with all these people, and you know, talk talk about haters like. People used to tell me, you suck, you'll never get anywhere. All of a sudden, I'm singing my hero's band, you know, the, who, to a lot of people, and Andy Wood is the holy grail of rock and roll, man. He is to me and to a lot of other people. But the swan song moment where, you know, as a kid, you think, I got to make it, I got to make it. And, you know, and, and making it, you think, is like, you have your house in the hills, you have a fat bank account, you're touring all over the world, this and that. But we sit, we did a gig in Seattle, so uh, malfunction. And that day, I took Andy and um, Kevin's mother out to lunch, and I was like, "Look, you'll never know what your songs, what your son's songs did for me as a kid. Like, I can't even explain it to you. I, it saved my life." So that night, I sang in front of the Soundgarden camp, the Alice in Chains camp, the Nirvana camp, the fucking Love Bone camp. Andy's mother. We did a gig in Seattle, and I sang those songs. And um, I remember seeing Andy's mom in the face, or I remember seeing Andy's mom's face in the crowd, and it was luminous. And, and I remember she was astonished because for me, it's not about me. I, I want to channel. I, I prayed on my knees before I got on stage and said, "Please, God, let Andy sing through me. Let me sing these songs for his mother." his brother, his family, his friends, his fans, and don't let me make it about me. And and I did that, man. And I have goosebumps. And that was the fucking moment I made it inside, dude. You know, like, I made it, like, spiritually, emotionally. That was my moment, man, where I was just like, wow, you know, like, blew my mind. And I've had moments where been through a lot of shit and I've had moments where I'm like okay it was all worth it to get to this point or whatever but you know. some truly incredible moments um you know and just uh, great moments to share it as you said going through all the shit but like it's worth it for those you know for those moments and I'm I'm glad that you know especially with the um with malfunction like that that moment right there sounds truly incredible it really was and uh, dude and to top it off, after that, I remember one night or after the gig, um, someone goes, you know, Lane and Andy would have loved you. I, it chokes me up now. I started to cry, dude. You know, because I didn't know Lane. I live with Mike, but I didn't know Lane. And then after me and my crew guy, we go into the fucking airport in Seattle, dude. And I stop dead in my tracks. I'm like, oh my God, listen, listen. Throughout, I have goosebumps. Throughout the whole airport, dude. What song are they playing out of the plethora of songs in this world? Mother Love Bone's biggest song, Star Dog Champion. They're playing throughout the fucking airport. Like, if that wasn't a message, you know, it was. It was such a beautiful, beautiful experience. And you know, what's fucked up is that I had to quit my my heroes band because of the inner politics, you know, but. I did have those beautiful moments and was honored to be a part of that legacy. And man, my fucking name gets, you know, put in the mix with Andy Wood. Like there's no higher honor. It, it reminds me of Wayne's world where they're like, we're not worthy kind of deal. But apparently I am worthy. And that's pretty cool to have that. So. Oh, it definitely, especially, you know, to be kind of intermixed with all of that as well. Like, that's definitely such an incredible thing. And, you know, something, you know, that uh, I'm not sure, you know, not something you would have thought of, like, when you first started. But now, like, you are here and you're, you're, you are part of it. I think it's just incredible. I, I remember telling Andy's mom and brother, I was like, you know, I showed up in Hollywood from New York as a teenager with a bag, a plastic bag of clothes and a mother lug bone tape and a fucking dream. You know, so. are you hip to Mother Love Bone? 
I've heard a few of their songs. I'm not uh, okay. super familiar, but I, yeah, I, I go know down, who they are. Yeah. Go down the rabbit hole on that one. I highly recommend it. I definitely, I'm definitely going to check out more of their stuff. Yeah. All right. So, uh, close out this interview. So, um, for you, I really appreciate the conversation. I had a great time chatting with you. you so, uh, for um, Blacklist Union, um, what's kind of the rest of this year looking like? Because there are going to be like some live shows. You know, you obviously have the album coming out in September. What's kind of the rest of this year looking like? You know, so we're playing the Whiskey um, uh, uh, July 29th um, in LA. Uh, it's a it's the Crew Fest, which is um, a charity event every year for Skylar Neal, who is Vince Neal's little girl who passed away. Uh, then we're doing a, uh, a CD release party at the Viper Room in LA. Um, I think that's the fifth, it's a Saturday, the, either the fifteenth or sixteenth of September. Um, our record release party, and then we're in talks right now about going to Europe with Warrior Soul who's also one of my biggest influences, um, a band from New York that was around the 90s that I love. So um, they're a huge influence on Blacklist Union and our sound. So we're, we're talking with them right now about doing that. So that's what's happening right now. Right on. I hope the shows go well. I do hope uh, the European tour with uh, it happens. That sounds really awesome. I hope all that works out for you. So last thing uh, before we sign off, um, for everyone watching and listening, where are the best places to find Blacklist Union? Google, you know, Blacklist, one word, Union. And then, um, you know, we have our blacklistunion.com. We're on every single platform there is to find our music. We have videos on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on TikTok. We're on fucking Instagram. We're on all of it. I, I think now we're going to have to get on this new and threads it's like you know i'm fucking I, i'm not into social media at all but like i have to be by default you know i don't run our shit you know because i don't like it but believe it or not there's people that actually do like it you know so they're happy to do it and get paid for it so i mean i do answer our messages and i'll post sometimes but i can't it's a lot there's so many distractions in the fucking world it's like you know I gotta keep my focus, you know. No, I, to I totally know what you mean. There's a lo lot of stuff out there. It seems like there's new ones, just like with threads, just popping up all the time yeah. that you have to be a part of. So, now I'm glad you got a team and people um, who are uh, able to do it. You can focus on obviously just making kick-ass music. Where, where are you located? Uh, South Bend, Indiana. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, just just right before like 15 minutes from the Michigan border. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's rock and roll, fucking central right there man that's right that, that definitely for sure especially between chicago and detroit definitely oh, yeah you know i i was just saying in an interview the other day in detroit like you know man if you want to know if you're good or bad go to detroit because they'll fucking let you know and if you're bad they might kick your ass but <laughs> you know if you're good they'll fucking love you you know and i i love detroit man it's one of my favorite places to play Oh, yeah, definitely a totally different vibe there with like just everything compared to other places. And oh, you know, yeah. one of my favorite, like my favorite artists of all time is Alice Cooper. So, you know, obviously right. they were in Cal originally in like Phoenix and California, but they moved to Detroit and that's where they really started getting their, um, you know, popularity and audience and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a uh, go-to city. If you like want to try to make it and have a shot at making it definitely Detroit with rock and roll. I agree. So, Tony, thank you so much for stopping by Super Cool Radio. I had such a great time chatting with you. Please check out and support Blacklist Union. I'll drop some links for Blacklist Union in the description of this podcast. Tony, I appreciate uh, you hanging out with me. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. It was nice chatting with you. Of course. So, for Tony West of Blacklist Union, I'm your host, always, Matthew Thomas. Thank you so much for watching and listening to Super Cool Radio. And remember, stay frosty.